Are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three. <laughs> I, I missed. <laughs> LHC stands for the Large Hadron Collider, which is this amazing particle accelerator uh, out there in Switzerland. So it's up and running again. Beams going around one direction, beams going around another direction. So the Large Hadron Collider is uh, something that collides hadrons. So what are hadrons? Hadrons are basically subatomic particles. A hadron is a particle which contains quarks. And that's it. It undergoes what's known as the strong force, strong interactions. There are sort of fundamentally two types of particles uh, in the universe. There are hadrons and leptons. So hadrons are the ones made up of quarks, which you may have heard of, these f very fundamental particles of, of material. And so they're things like protons and neutrons, the things that make up normal material are made up of quarks. The LHC is simply uh, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's all about crashing hadrons into each other. Um, and so this is a real boy toy. This is all about taking two things and going bang and watching them fall apart and seeing what's inside. It's a 27 kilometer ring around which they send protons. These are objects that you and I are made of. They make up the core of, of, of our nuclei. The whole game in particle physics is to figure out uh, the properties that the fundamental properties of matter uh, and that almost always involves going to discover more and more massive particles. We know about the lower mass particles and we're trying to learn about the more and more massive particles. Because of the most famous equation in the world, E equals mc squared, you can actually create a massive particle, m, by having lots of E, lots of energy. So if you smash things together with enough energy, you can actually turn that energy into mass. And so the whole game in particle physics is cranking your particle accelerators up to higher and higher energies and so you can actually probe more and more massive particles, generate more and more massive particles. The way this, part of this thing works is by smashing protons into each other. And they fire many billions of them around in one direction and many billions of them around in the other direction. They accelerate them so that they reach almost at the speed of light. In fact, they reach so close to the speed of light, I was working this out earlier today, that they're only off the speed of light by about the speed of Usain Bolt, about 10 meters per second. They get so close to the speed of light. And when you smash these protons into each other, um, you create a whole shower of different particles. But the point is that the most massive particles you can create get bigger and bigger as the energy of those proton beams get higher and higher. Essentially, what the Large Hadron Collider is, is a very large hammer, right? And it's just exactly the same experiment that we've all been doing since we were three years old. And actually, I've brought that experiment with me today. Here it is. Um, this is an experiment I first did as a child. The idea is that all the mass in these particles <laughs> smash together, and then all that mass gets created into energy, which then gets redistributed into a whole series of new particles. You're looking to see what sort of way this energy can come out. And there are lots of known processes that you know about because it produces quarks or it produces some other debris coming out, gluons or whatever. And after that, there is now the possibility that once in a blue moon, a very rare event will occur where you'll see the traces of a particle you've not seen before, the Higgs boson. And if you see that, it comes out with a particular characteristic feature. It's not a process that's been seen before. So you're looking in all this debris of all the known events for a little signal for that particular thing, which is rather like looking for a needle in a haystack. And because the energies are so high, the hope is that they'll be able to create particles with, a large, with the kind of masses that existed in the very early universe, about a billionth of a second after the beginning of the universe. And these particles have become famous already. I mean, even though they've not been discovered, the Higgs particles, supersymmetric particles, dark matter particles. What we're going to do is we're going to have a look and see precisely what is going on inside this toy hot rod here. OK, so first of all, we're going to need some safety equipment. I have absolutely no idea if this is going to work. It worked when I was three. You might just imagine they'll reassemble back into the protons that they were formed from. But in, in actual fact, there are so many different ways that you can redistribute this energy that it's, it's highly unlikely that they'll reassemble back into this very particular shape of the protons. And they're, they're moving, the energy gets redistributed in all different directions. And so you, 
you'd need to bring all this energy back if you're going to reconstitute the protons, and you can't do that. The Large Hadron Collider is in the news now um, because it's being switched back on again. So the story was it was switched on with a big fanfare uh, a little over a year ago, uh, worked for a very little while, um, and then it had a very serious engineering failure. One, two, three. <laughs> I, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> the way this thing works is you, you, you accelerate these particles up to a huge speed and in order to do that you need enormous magnetic fields, very, very large magnetic fields. The only way we can generate those very large magnetic fields is with these things called superconductors, superconducting magnets. And in order to get a superconducting magnet to work, you need to cool it down to very, very low temperatures. So these things are cooled down with, with liquid helium to just a couple of degrees above absolute zero, so they're very, very cold. Um, but you've got this rather dangerous combination of tons and tons, I think there's about 100 tons of liquid helium in the whole Large Hadron Collider. So you've got 100 tons of liquid helium, which is you know, very cold and quite dangerous stuff, and very, very strong magnetic fields, which are literally trying to pull the entire structure of the Large Hadron Collider apart, as well as accelerating these particles around, because you know, the different magnets that make up the, like, the LHC all attract each other, just like normal bar magnets do. Um, and unfortunately, this combination of things proved to be too much. There was a big failure, but basically one of these, mirror, one of these uh, magnets just collapsed uh, under the strain it was under, and in the process ended up dumping about a ton of this liquid helium, so almost a sort of swimming pool's worth of liquid helium out all over the tunnel. Can we try it again? <laughs> right. One, two, three. Okay, so there it is. Well, one of the fundamental difficulties or problems with physics um, and at the, in the 21st century is trying to bring together quantum mechanics and gravity. And um, so the, um, the, 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 one of the ways of trying to do this is via something called the Higgs boson. So it's this Higgs boson that is the, 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 the particle effectively that gives things mass. What, what the Large Hadron Collider is really all about is finding this God particle, the Higgs boson. Okay, now the Higgs boson is what's going to explain to us where mass comes from. So we go through our field of debris in our collision and we pick out the one thing, the Higgs boson. When we try to describe nature, when we try to describe the forces of nature, we have a model, we have a mathematical model in which we find there are these particles present. And one of them happens to be the Higgs particle. It's the particle that will give masses to objects in the universe, to, to, to other particles in the universe. But there are other, proper other particles that have been predicted that we believe should be there because there are other symmetries present in the universe that are in these models, or we hope these symmetries are there. One of them is called supersymmetry. It's a tough one because if you're a particle physicist, you'll say, actually, you know, this is a really exciting experiment, and even if it finds nothing at all, that's very exciting because that rules out lots of things that we currently think might be the way the universe works. More, I mean, I'm not a particle physicist, you know, and so actually I, I want to see a result. And if, I, if it ends up producing a result and says, you know, here's the Higgs boson, here's what its mass is, here's what its properties are, and here's we learn something else about the way the universe works, then I'll get very excited about it. If at the end of its lifetime they basically say, well, we've excite, done all this exciting science and found nothing very much, um, then I will be less excited about it. So it's at that point of discovery, you know, that if they do find something, it'll be brilliant as far as I'm concerned. If they don't find anything, you're really going to have to talk to, to someone who's a real specialist in the area who'll be able to tell you why it's still exciting. It's, uh, so it's a, a multi-billion pound project. It's probably the single most expensive engineering project there's ever been. It's certainly the single most expensive physics project there's ever been. Um, and so, you know, one of the obvious questions is, is it worth spending this kind of money on these kinds of things? And it's a tough one to answer, especially in current economic climate, as to whether it really is. I guess there's a couple of answers. One is that, you know, that fundamentally the whole human endeavour has been about finding out more about our surroundings, more about the universe, and this is really just the next step of that. But the other thing that you really have to give the particle physicists credit for is, of course, they're, they're famous for, though they should be more famous than they are, but they're the, one of the, the things that they should be most famous for is one of the biggest spin-offs that has ever been from an experiment which is that it was particle physics, physicists who were entirely responsible for the World Wide Web. In their earlier experiments, when they, were, when they were doing basically these same kind of things, but rather lower energies, in order to communicate their results around all the particle physicists and make sure everyone was up to speed, they invented this thing, the World Wide Web, for, for disseminating their results around their colleagues. And everything we've seen, the, the hundreds of billions of pounds a year that the internet is now worth to industry, 
all comes out of those particle physicists messing around. So if you ask, are they value for money, I think it's hard to argue against the idea that actually they've paid for themselves many times over and they should have their new experiment.